evening. At this time, I'd like to call to, to order the Ordinance Committee relative to Council Order 2016-267, discussing the Land Disposition Agreement, Parcel R1, and the A5 Lot. Madam please call the Council King. Council Bull. Present. Council Coleman. Present. Council Ben. Council Harris. Present. Council Hughes. Present. Council Lee. Present. Council Tomichi. Present. Chairman Collins. Thank you, President. And with that, we'd like to start from the floor. Bill Geary, Special Counsel to the Mayor for Downtown Development, to give us an update since our prior committee meeting. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman, and through you to your colleagues here on the committee and the council. Uh, I'll be very brief because I know uh, the council uh, has a busy schedule this evening. Um, but uh, among the materials that have been provided to you through the graces of Jen Manning is uh, the uh, timeline that uh, the councilors had uh, requested and were provided to the council last time. Um, Council of Family refers to them as the road map. Uh, and so you should have copies of that. Since we met last, uh, the special legislation that I did reference uh, uh, during my last appearance before the council was uh, at that time had been enacted by the general court and on the Friday before New Year's Eve was signed by the governor and is now uh, the law of chapter 3 um, We also did provide uh, an agenda for this evening's uh, uh, presentation, and uh, that uh, shows uh, the items that we will be presenting tonight. Principally, um, a uh, review by our financial uh, expert, uh, Craig Seymour, managing principal of RKG Associates, pertaining to uh, the economics of the uh, downtown developments that have been proposed and actually uh, some updates on what has transpired over the course of the last uh, two years um, <coughs> with the property values in the downtown area. Um, and then, of course, uh, each of the members of the council were provided with a copy of the uh, appraisal that <coughs> was conducted by an independent appraiser pertaining to uh, the parcel known as R1, uh, also known as the O'Connell Development Parcel. 15-story uh, apartment building, uh, and uh, we will have a presentation and analysis of that independent appraisal by the city's uh, expert, Pam McKinney uh, of Burn McKinney and Associates. So with that uh, introduction, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Seymour to step forward and uh, commence his presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Gary. Good evening. Um, again, my name is Craig Seymour. I'm the president and managing principal of RKG Associates. Nice to be back here uh, to discuss the downtown in the fifth. Uh, brief slideshow here. Um, what I'd like to do is, is start the evening, start this, this presentation. I'll try to be brief because we have seen most of this before. Um, just to Gary said that update you on where uh, the DIF is today, where it's going uh, based upon these developments, such as the R1 um, uh, development that's in front of you today. If you recall, the DIF was established uh, by the council in May of 2005. This uh, year, 2006, was set as the base year in which the uh, values uh, were locked in at that point. Uh, and in, in fiscal year 2007, the differential between the growth of the base value and, and the new development took place as the increment uh, that is then funneled in towards <coughs> be used for public uh, infrastructure improvements. Um, since the t between 2000, fiscal year 2017 and, and fiscal year 2006, the uh, value of the assessed property within the DIF district has risen uh, by about $680 million in total. Um, and that has been an increase of $93.6 million, $93 million in the residential uh, value and $43.3 million in the commercial value. That's the increase in the assessed values for that. Um, 
I say to here that to remember that the DIF is focused on, on making improvements within the district, public improvements within that, that then serve to leverage private investment that comes in and does the actual development uh, and incentivizes that through you know, utilities, for example, moving the town brook, doing the streetscapes, doing the, the kinds of uh, doing parking, which is one of the most critical aspects of our uh, revitalize in the downtown. Um, and most of the, the municipal uh, work that we're talking about, the development that's going to occur, are focusing on both the Hancock lot and eventually the Ross Garage area. Uh, but I need to remind you, if you look at the map, that the diff area includes a much larger portion of downtown, even larger than the urban development area, and it allows it to capture the development that takes place, the increase in values that take place, not only within the exact parcels that are being uh, dealt with right now, but also within the overall downtown as the saying goes, a uh, rising tide raises all boats, in this case, are all ships. In this case, there is, and we've been able to capture um, rising values as the downtown Quincy turns the corner and begins to uh, uh, in, increase its investment. Uh, private investment begins to increase. The growth in assessed value um, in the bar chart here shows the difference between 2006, 2016, and what has been projected out in 2034. And the map there is just the latest version of the uh, Hancock lot redevelopment with R1 uh, shown on that. 2034 is a projection based upon three things. One is known projects, those that are in the pipeline, in, either been permitted or about to be permitted coming before you. There are the proposed projects, and those have been discussed, people have talked about, but the idea projects on specific parcels. And then there's uh, the rest of the urban revitalization in the downtown, which is really part of an urban design exercise that the city has been going through to look at some of these lots, such as the Ross lot, um, and, and project what could happen there based upon the market, based upon um, the activities today. Current DIF revenues, um, I compared here uh, 2016 to 2017, and this is the actual DIF revenue, uh, the increases in, in taxes uh, that are being pulled off. Um, and you can see that difference, it went up uh, by about 300,000, over $350,000 just in the, in the past fiscal years. Uh, with most of that gain coming from, virtually all of the gain coming from the increased uh, residential valuation, about $36.7 million. Uh, that is almost exclusively uh, west of Chestnut. Uh, and I use that as an example because that's really the first game changer for downtown uh, Quincy and for re redevelopment. Uh, it is starting to make a big, uh, you know, it's, it's nearly full now as far as I know. Uh, it is starting to establish Quincy within the larger regional marketplace as a destination to not only live, but also to work and to play which is the goal of many of these downtown uh, projects. Um, but there are, of course, risks associated with uh, downtown development and real estate in general. And I try to uh, break these risks down into three categories. Uh, and these risks are really focused on how, what impacts are forecasting in the diff revenues in order to cover bond service as we go forward. There's opportunity risk, and these are risks that can be controlled to a certain extent by the city. And they are an anchor developer backs out. You know, a deal isn't struck. You have a project scale change that limits the catalytic effects. Things are not big enough. If you're trying to do it in just a very incremental way, that's going to slow things down. That's a risk to the cash flows coming in and to cover the debt service. There's economic risk, and that's really outside the control of the city. Uh, and then if you look at the real national real estate market for that, uh, it has experienced a prolonged boom. Uh, there are procrastinators, there are prognosticators out there who are predicting that things may slow down. There are just as many people out there predicting things are going to continue much stronger perhaps over the next 40 years. Uh, but there's also interest rate risk or financial risk. Again, it's outside of the control of the city, but it's something I want to talk about tonight because uh, by waiting, we know that the interest rates are probably going to be going up. And by waiting, there's a cost associated with that that we want to buy. On the opportunity risk side for the Hancock lot development, um, 
it, you know, as, you, as you're aware of, it consists of four uh, separate parcels, uh, buildings in one parking garage with the O'Connell building, the R1 being a landmark, 15-story downtown development, uh, much different than what the market would call for. This is a, a unique property, unique development proposition that's before you. Um, the central parking garage is absolutely essential to not only O'Connell's, but also to R2 and R3, the rest of the Hancock block and the downtown uh, itself. You have to have parking not only for residents, but for visitors, employees, uh, and others. And by centralizing the parking lot on property that you own uh, is essential to that success. Uh, the O'Connell the O'Connell project, in my opinion, is very catalytic in that it increases property values not only for itself, but also for the adjoining parcels. Uh, R2 and R3, once uh, R1 is completed, you're going to see much more interest on the part of investors coming in to look at those and develop those, because they want to be part of a successful downtown. And by having R1 uh, developed, you're going to um, start that process and support that process, which reduces uh, further future risk out in, into the, as we move forward. Um, on the Hancock lot and the Ross garage, if we bring in both of those parcels, um, the, the Hancock lot doesn't sit by itself. It's an important part of downtown, as you know. The Ross garage site, again, that you have a major controlling interest in, the Ross garage, you are a property owner. You, the city has uh, an ownership interest and is a, a part of that whole development process. Uh, it will be lifted up as well and development interests there, which have already started to, to come forward, uh, will be captured. The graph here shows that, um, again, just these two lots, Hancock and the Ross Garage site, through the urban design process that have gone forward, you'll see the increase in overall uh, diff revenue raising from the two to three million dollars we're talking about in the short term to nine, nine million dollars or so over a uh, 20 year period. For financial risk, I put in here this graph from just the other day about what's happening in interest rates. The bottom line is the one-year uh, uh, government rate, the 10-year bond rate uh, is the upper line. I didn't find a 20-year rate, which is more indicative. It's a little higher than that, uh, but it follows the same trend pattern. Um, the Federal Reserve, I heard this morning, um, is pretty much committed now to a series of small incremental interest rate hikes and base federal rate. Uh, that's going to be translated through into inter general interest rates, and particularly into bond rates, both for the bands um, that would be issuing. Um, in the short term, they reflect that one year rate at the bottom, as well as the longer term bonds, which, refer which reflect the longer term federal interest rate plus the risk premium for the time frames goes on top of that. So, as you see there on the right hand side of that graph, in the last few months, um, the interest rates have gone up. Uh, rates have gone up almost a percentage point. Um, from what I hear from the economic world is that they see that as a short-term aggravation that had some a lot to do with the uncertainty due to the election. They are starting to paper off now and flatten out. I've heard some economists say that they're not going to rise as steeply other than when the Fed rate goes up, they'll go up in step. But there are a few others that say there may be some other larger increases in bond rates in particular uh, moving forward. And the point of that is that the need for the city to lock in some of these rates as best it can, as early as it can, is important. Uh, this graph here uh, shows that delays in development can have a serious financial impact um, between both the bands, which will be projected out and use about 1% on those, and then very those to 4% um, bonds when the time comes. The interest rate on the bonds, if they go up by 1%, if you just watch that graph on your screen, you'll see it jump up. Uh, and over a 20 year period, that's a little over five, five and a half million dollars in uh, additional interest costs that will be paid on those. Um, well, that's fine. There's going to be plenty of diff revenue coming in from this development, uh, spurred on by the parking garage and O'Connell's. Uh, and also, rates and touch five and a half million dollars that might not be coming. If we're in this rate, right, if you wait that long, it won't be coming to the, get back to the general fund. Lastly, uh, just to, to again to provide the context, 
Uh, the diagram on the left is an earlier rendition of uh, the Hancock lot with items in place there. The one on the right is a urban design uh, analysis done that we have done in order to, the team has done really, to be able to start to look at the Ross Garage site and hypothesize what might go there as this development, as the, the interest in downtown Quincy continues. So with that, I'll end my presentation. Any questions now or take any questions? Mm -hmm. How's the problem, Jim? Do you want to get through? Do you have some other? I won't take one. That's fine. Okay. Uh, just a couple more questions. Morning, I should thank you for the, um, uh, for the presentation. Do we have uh, an appreciation rate in the diff area that we can compare to an appreciation rate uh, in other parts of the city or to the city uh, as a whole? What we've used in our model is an appreciation citywide and applied it to that. Okay. So uh, we can. For, for the background for the baseline assessment. So, but is there somewhere, is there a number where I can see what the appreciation has been in the diff versus the rest of the city? That's a, just, a, just a background appreciation or the increase in well, rev in taxable revenue, taxable assessment. Well, that's the same thing. Wouldn't it be the same thing? Yeah, but we had to all of it. The data is in the model. Right. The data is in the model. In the, um, in the Hancock lot area, within the diff area, uh, it captures not only the general general growth of tax of tax assessments as recorded by the assessor, but also all the new development that comes place and new construction, and that can, can be compared to the city. Yeah, I understand. Right. We haven't done that. Could that be provided to us? Sure. I would like to see what the appreciation rate citywide is versus the appreciation rate in the diff area. I mean, arguably. The whole premise of investing in the downtown is so that it um, acts as a catalyst. And a couple times you use the word catalyst in here. It acts as a catalyst for growth. So I'd like to see what those, what um, the different rates are, mm -hmm. right? So if we have it through the years, I mean there hasn't been until uh, west of Chestnut open, there hadn't been anything that actually should have moved that needle. Right, this, this talk and whatnot, but there's nothing that should have moved that needle because there was nothing that was open, there was nothing that was, um, you know, spurring growth. And I know that the, that the diff zone, uh, the diff area, had grown through just natural appreciation, which I'm thankful that you accounted for because I feel like oftentimes when we're, we're being presented with information about the diff, it's as if nothing happening in the downtown, just the talk of the downtown has led to this great boom in values downtown is actually just a natural appreciation that we can see because prices go up over right, years. Right, there's a natural market, market right. appreciation. Right, just as depreciation will be the result of, you know, X building being built because the market takes a dive, the interest rates, what have you. Um, that, that's really my, my main question. The, the other one was, um, well, I guess it's probably better for um, later on in the presentation. But if you could get us those numbers about the appreciation, sure. I, would, we'll take, we'll take I would appreciate that. Thank you. Are you going to have to go over the presentation? That was the plan. Yes. We're good with that? Okay. okay. Great. Okay, at this point, thank you, Mr. Seymour. At this point, we'll have Pam McKinney from the Jane Associates for uh, focusing on our financial provision of the LD. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Nice to see you again. Same. Oh, Ron is going to help me with the party out. I can't do um, My uh, goal here tonight, uh, having described something of the financial structure the last time I was here, is to focus on something different. Uh, and that is specifically uh, to talk about the appraisal, because that's new news. And we now have a report uh, from uh, the offices of Foster Appraisal. Uh, and uh, Alan Foster has produced his report. And I uh, have uh, extracted from the report and from, uh, from Mr. Foster's um, work file a sort of a logic trail that I hope can help explain sort of how he's arrived at the uh, conclusion he's arrived at. And I will say that I, I've reviewed the report and the appraisal uh, and the methodology and so on, and I'm satisfied that uh, from a professional point of view, that uh, the conclusion he's arrived at uh, reflects the market value of the property. 
the, you should have a package that sort of follows my slide, so if it's easier for you to follow along on the hard copy, uh, I'll encourage you to do that. Um, the, the first uh, page, you know, uh, setting aside the appraisal document itself, um, the, the exhibits that were prepared for tonight's meeting, begin with, with sort of a summary of the answer. You know, I, I'm often asked, well, do, 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 uh, do you want the answer first, and then we'll explain how we got there, or do you want the, uh, the explanation and arrive at the answer at the end? I think it's, it's helpful to start with some understanding of where the conclusion is, and then we can backfill. Um, the, uh, the premise, as I described when we met last uh, time, uh, is to establish a market value predicated on what a market rate development of this parcel would consist of. Not the 15-story tower that Mr. O'Connell was proposing because, in fact, that project can't be built by the market in the absence of some of the uh, incentives that we uh, are talking about in the LBA. So market value, by definition, is what would a market rate developer do with the, with the site. And as I explained last time, uh, the methodology was to inquire of Boston Survey consultants or uh, your engineering consultants, uh, what would the maximum capacity of the site be if you were asking a developer to do a stick over podium uh, development, which is the market uh, typical approach to uh, development in, uh, in the suburban uh, non-downtown Boston environment today. And they have uh, sketched out uh, a program which uh, calls for a 48 unit, four story on top of a two and a half story parking podium uh, as being the feasible redevelopment uh, plan for the R1 site. And so that program, those 48 units of again, market rate development, become the basis for an appraisal of the property. And as you may know, if you know, you've looked at appraisals uh, from others in the past, the unit uh, of comparison, the metric that's used by appraisers for valuing residential property is based on that unit count. Because the number of units define for the developer what the economic potential of the property is, and that in turn helps the developer to calibrate a land price. How many dollars per unit of developable density can the site bear? And that becomes the basis for uh, evaluation. Now, in the case of R1, again, we have 48 units with their associated parking. And we also have a little bit of retail area, which, again, is typical for a residential development in the downtown. Uh, so resi on the ground floor with some parking, another layer and a half or so of parking on top of that, and then four stories of residential above. The uh, appraisal has um, uh, collected land sale information from other similar uh, projects that have occurred in the general vicinity. And you'll see, we'll get to them in a few moments, five transactions which are of comparable size. I think they range from 22 units uh, uh, in total up to 56 units. So bracketing the 48 unit concept that uh, the BSC has provided. And, um, and uh, those sale comparables provide us with an understanding of what other developers of similar property are paying on a per unit basis for the right to build multifamily housing. Uh, in addition, we have uh, in the appraisal, the appraisers has collected some retail uh, land sale comps so that we can ascribe an additive value for the right to build that additional ground floor retail. So it's the value is comprised of two pieces a price per unit for the residential development opportunity and a price per square foot for the retail that's included. And if you look at the, uh, this first page, the concluded value for the residential component is $37,000 per unit times 48 units 
gives us a multifamily value, the component for the multifamily of 1.776 million. And then there is the retail component, 3790 square feet times $50 a foot, provides an additive incremental value for the retail opportunity of 189.5, which gives us a total value before consideration for some of some other things which I'll come to of 1.9655 million. Now that is what someone would pay for the site if there were no obligations to do anything but build my project. In this particular case, the developer is going to be responsible to pay for, build and pay for, uh, some things that nobody else in this marketplace is paying for, uh, which is to say, uh, the developer is constructing a park on Cottage Street uh, and no other developer of uh, parcels that have been used for comparison purposes has been asked to create a park or to maintain that park over the life of, the, of a 40 year uh, time horizon. So for the purposes of establishing a market value for the transaction, we have to take what someone would pay as a free and clear without any strings or obligations, but we have to credit the cost <coughs> obligation that is unique to the agreement that is being struck here for park creation. This is off-site. This is not part of what the, uh, the developer here is acquiring. It is on top of, in addition to, beyond the boundaries of the parcel. And Woodward and Curran, who I know you're familiar with, has provided an estimate for uh, what it would take to construct the park improvements, hardscape, trees, shrubbery, <coughs> grass, etc. Uh, and in addition, uh, has provided us with an estimate of what the annual maintenance cost, because that is an obligation which the developer is taking on, an, the, an added maintenance cost associated with keeping the park in good shape over the life of the 40-year agreement that we are talking about. And that number is $21,500 per year to do uh, snow removal, to mow, to replace the shrubs, to repair the lighting, to repair the park benches, to repair, repair the hardscape. And $490,000 is the capitalized value of 21.5 per year for 40 years. And the very last page of what I'm going to show you is just the arithmetic that translates that annual cost obligation into uh, a, a, a capitalized value. So from the 1965.5, we subtract this extraordinary cost to build an off-site park and to maintain it over a 40-year time frame which produces a transaction value of $940,000. And that is the conclusion of the appraiser, again, based on a sales comparison approach and the capacity studies that were prepared uh, on by uh, BSC for this purpose. Now, if we want to, um, thank you, Rob, just sort of walk very quickly through the logic trail that underpins some of these assumptions, we begin with just a description of what the conveyance is. There's a fee parcel. Um, yes, if I could, Councilor Fed. Yeah, please. By and the again, way. I, Madam Chairman, I understand and recognize the uh, what you're trying to do, and I appreciate that and I support that. However, I just really want to make sure that at some point we are going to have a discussion to come back, specifically as it relates to the methodology related to the um, cost or the value some point. After, after you finish your presentation, we will be able to come back and discuss some of the issues related to the methodology. Oh, yes, that, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm happy to, to discuss it. We'll have it at any point. If questions open to any of the speakers. I just want to get them through. Sure. Okay, I understand. Yeah, and, and perhaps just the, the walking through here will, will help me answer some, some of those questions along the way. Uh, so we begin just to remind everybody what the conveyance is. There's a fee parcel. Uh, along with various easements, which the city will retain ownership in portions of those, 
a lot related to the requirement uh, that the city have the ability to have subgrade rights uh, for the purposes of either utility installation or underground parking. Um, and in addition, uh, some rights of public access and egress beyond the, the consumers or, or occupants of the, uh, of the residential development. Uh, and we have several pages, and again, I, I promised uh, Mr. Geary that I wouldn't read the, uh, the easement uh, descriptions into the record, but just so that people are aware, in your package, You'll, you'll see that there's a memo from Paul Hines which describes the various rights that are being retained by the city and are being conveyed to the developer. Uh, so that's sort of the next four or five pages, again, just so that you know uh, what uh, is included. And this picture that uh, is on the screen right now uh, that falls behind uh, Paul Hines' memo is a, is a snapshot of the uh, program which BSC has developed for a prototypical residential full floor. 12 units per floor times four floors of resi again above the parking podium gets us to that 48th unit uh, program. And you might wonder, well, why, why uh, four stories over two and a half? It's because once you go above that, you're no longer talking stick over podium you now have the additional cost associated with high-rise construction. Once, once you're at seven stories, that's the, uh, the cost of high-rise construction comes into play. So that's why we aren't you know, showing 10 stories or nine stories rather than, than the, the levels that we're talking about here. Um, and again, it's why uh, for the purposes of the LDA, we're talking about needing supports because uh, at 15 stories, the O'Connell project can't uh, can't bear that high-rise cost. So that's just a little snapshot to show you uh, what BSC has done uh, to arrive at the 48-unit uh, plan. And what follows after that are the land sales that have been used. There's a summary um, with a little map so that you can see where they are. And the intent here, again, has been to, uh, by the appraisers, to, is to select developments that are relatively recent, relatively proximate, and relatively similar in size. That is to say, not 300 units, because we're trying to price something that's 48 units, and not two units, again, because the, the subject property has a 48 unit capacity. Those sites, uh, took place, or those transactions took place uh, in uh, 2014 and 2015. Uh, one of them very proximate, that 18 to 22 Mechanic Street uh, transaction is virtually across the street. We have two others on Hancock Street. We have a sale at 39 Fayette Street and a sale at 68 Beale Street. And if you look at the price per unit, the price per unit that developers had paid for those parcels ranged from, again, unadjusted, from roughly $31,000 per unit up to about $50,000 per unit. So before there's an adjustment process, that's sort of the band that we're in. Um, and again, 22 units ranging up to 56 units in terms of the scale. Um, the next several pages, uh, simply provide information that the appraiser has collected about the transactions themselves. Sales 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And again, I'm not going to go through these uh, ad nauseum, but just so that you can see the sort of data that has been compiled uh, in order to understand the characteristics of, uh, of each of those transactions. And that leads then to uh, the appraiser's adjustment grid. And there are several kinds of adjustments that have been made. Um, for starters, uh, the appraiser has looked at uh, the requirements that the developers of these other sites were subject to with respect to a couple of very important things that are unique to the Quincy bylaw, which have to do with public art and affordability. 
And the assumption here is that if, if a private developer were coming forward to do a pure market rate uh, project on this site, they would be subject to the public art requirements and the affordability requirements. It, it, it's, it follows naturally that unless you need relief, you're going to do what's required. And so <coughs> each of these transactions has a slightly different uh, uh, so, subject to a slightly different set of characteristics. Uh, as you can probably tell, um, the, some of them have both art and affordability requirements. For example, the Mechanic Street site has no adjustment required because that site has both art and affordability requirements in wood. Uh, contrast that with 1545 Hancock Street, which uh, had no affordable uh, requirement in their permit. Uh, and so the adjustment is uh, a downward adjustment to account for the fact that that one had, um, had uh, a, a need to be adjusted for the, the affordability. And, and likewise, we have lesser um, adjustments being made for those uh, that did not have um, a public art requirement. After that, we have permits um, and public process. In most instances, uh, the transactions were made uh, with permits in hand, you know, after permits had been obtained. Ordinarily, developers don't buy land until they have every permission that they need buttoned up. So adjustments have been made for that. And after that, there is time because the markets have been uh, changing over the last uh, several months, uh, and I'm appreciating, I should say. And we have, at least in the case of the Beale Street uh, site, a need to adjust for location. That location is considered by the appraiser to be less good than uh, the other sites uh, that are in question. And we also have a need to adjust for use, because two of the transactions are, were acquired for condominium development, not for multifamily. And condo land, generally speaking, trades at a premium to multifamily land. The, the that intrinsic value of land, because of the economics of condo development, uh, tend to put those numbers at a, at a premium. And so once those adjustments are made, we have uh, you know, a net adjustment and an adjusted range at the end of the day that ranges from $30,000 a unit to $41,008 per unit. And the appraiser has concluded the average of the comps is $36,800. The appraiser has concluded to a $37,000 per unit value. Uh, again, to arrive at that uh, million um, million uh, seven seventy six for the multifamily component. Again, this is all prior to uh, the addition of the retail and to that final set of adjustments related to the public park. Uh, the retail land sale adjustment process is similar. Um, it's not usual to find retail as a standalone. Uh, and so the appraiser has gone further afield than for the multifamily sales to look at retail transactions um, in the, more in the metro market area and has concluded again after some adjustments mostly related to location uh, to a value of $50, $50 per square foot of retail area. Again, times the BSC square footage of 37 60, whatever it is, gives us an incremental value for the retail component of, a, of 189.5. So we add those two together to get to the million nine uh, plus in the aggregate. And the final uh, process here is to calibrate the adjustments, those final adjustments for the park. And I've included in the package the two Woodward and Kern memos which speak to both the cost of the park construction, um, thanks Rob, and then the next one, uh, to the annual maintenance cost, and then finally to the present value computation, which gives us the capitalized PV of the 40 years worth of 
uh, annual maintenance obligation. And so that's where that $490,000 uh, number came from uh, that's referenced on the, on the first summary page. So that's sort of, that's about as fast as a, 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 you know, a thumbnail kind of walk through uh, of a relatively complicated process as I can offer. And I'd be very pleased to talk about methodology or whatever other questions you can have. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. At this time, we're actually going to recess the ordinance committee meeting. We do have a public hearing. We need to open up our city council meeting. We will recess the city council meeting and come back and continue this. Okay. After, um, upon the coming soon for this ordinance committee meeting, we do have Mr. Gary and Mr. Bob Davis talking about the legal rights and responsibility of the city and the developer under the terms as well as counsel to the city council, Mr. Kim Shea. So those are two more things for city for the city. So at this point, I am going to recess the ordinance committee meeting. Go ahead. You know there's, a, there's an option on that, that would shut, shut and the sound off. And this time, I'm going to call to order the public hearing relative trying, to just got the camera. 2016 it's, 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 074. I know it bothers you. I'm not doing it on purpose. And if I shut it off, it's for you. These are amending chapter 375 of the building, section 9. Special permit. A package. Uh, section 9.49, chapter 11, and special permit. And then entitled to add a new section, 15.28, entitled wage theft prevention, currently pending at the public site. With that, we, we do welcome public testimony. Anyone wishing to speak in favor, please come forward. Anyone wishing to speak in favor. We're going to sign in favor. We do have sign in sheets in the rear of the chamber. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition, we welcome you to come forward. Either or, counsel, or you welcome to come forward. And wishing to speak in opposition or sign in opposition, the sign in sheets are at the rear of the chamber. Having no one come forward, this time we will call that public hearing in post.
the regular council meeting and go back to the uh, ordinance committee meeting. So we'll adjourn right now and um, council will forward to the council.